Uh, let me introduce Paul Kitagaki, who uh, I worked alongside on some assignments back when he and I both worked in the Bay Area uh, at newspapers when I worked at the Hayward Daily Review and he worked, I believe, at the Examiner. Um, during the flooding, I remember, I wanted to remember to thank him, I'm not sure I ever did. Um, the flooding in Rio Vista in 1983, when I was just mm. starting on my job, we were both in a levee that was collapsing and I was about five seconds from being in the water when he grabbed my elbow and- I did? <laughs> You did. I will always be wow. grateful for that. <laughs> um, so let me introduce this project, this really incredible project. I wanted him, I wanted Paul to be the first presentation uh, for this series of photographers that we have. Um, I have been following his work for, I'd say, the last decade. He had an exhibit in Sacramento about five, six years ago that I really wanted to go to and family stuff came up. I couldn't make it. Um, so it's called, Gum I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Paul, uh, Gumbadi Leg and Legacy of an Enduring Spirit. Um, and what it does is it documents, documents and illuminates a very dark episode in our country's history, the relocation and incarceration of more than 120,000 ethnic Japanese Americans during World War II. Just a horrible time. He was searching through photos at the National Archives in 1984 when he found a photo taken by Dorothea Lang of his grandparents and his father preparing to board a bus in Oakland. And through a lot of research over the years, he spent the past 16 years um, winning the trust of so many people, families, and doing their portraits, documenting their stories of survival and inner strength to overcome the injustice, racism, and the wartime history. Uh, he says, quote, their stories and photographs inspired me to discover how mass incarceration changed the lives of Japanese Americans and to capture their legacy of perseverance and resilience after unjustly losing their homes, businesses, and sometimes families. So uh, it's a pretty remarkable project. I can't wait to see it and to hear you talk about it, Paul. Oh, thanks, all. Um, yeah, it's been a lifelong um, project. I mean, I didn't know when I started out as a photographer, this was gonna be one of my things I was gonna finish up on, but I wanna share, you, share some other work. Um, I'm also a, a photographer or photo, photojournalist at the Sacramento Bee currently. And uh, I kind of wanted to share some other work I do besides, I was always talking about uh, showing some other work that I do at the newspaper. And I also have photographed 10 Olympic games and I usually um, work for Zuma Press in Santa, in um, San Clemente and uh, photograph the game. So I was just at Tokyo earlier this year during the pandemic. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit of work uh, just have a little bit of daily work from the newspaper, and then I was going to talk about my my project. Um, so, does that sound like a good thing to go for him? Okay, so I guess I'll start sharing the screen. Screen share. Come on. Okay, um, this is just before the pandemic started. This is one of the, the fires up in near Santa Rosa. And uh, Terry Schmidt, who's a UPI photographer, um, long time in the Bay Area. He was the first guy who kind of discovered the spot when we were driving around the, in the middle of the night, trying to make fire pictures. And his saw his car there, saw this tree just kind of glowing in the wind and made a nice long time exposure of the fire. Um, I also cover a lot of sports. I cover the 49ers and covered the Giants. And um, I've been working in, in the as a photojournalist for 44 years. 10 of the years, though, I was up in uh, Portland and in uh, Seattle before I came back to Sacramento. Um, Super Bowl, Montana and uh, Dan Marino. So at the start of at the pandemic, um, we were not 
the newspaper was not nobody's coming in the office like many places um we we're barely going out and i enterprise this picture going to a catholic church in the sacramento area and uh photograph this woman coming in to, to pray at the church um and the uh priest at the church he was still taking confessionals but he would spray down the uh, chairs after doing the confessional so i was looking for these little slices of life that would try to make the pandemic uh, more um uh, i guess humanistic you know show the the human toll we also had the um <coughs> um <coughs> protests up in sacramento for black Lives matter um during one of these weekends I also had was uh, uh, robbed of a camera and had my hand broken. Covered Donald Trump coming to, to view the California wildfires. And in January of uh, 2000, oops, of 2021, the Sacramento Bee, this is the last run of the, the presses in the building. They were closing in the building. And uh, this is the last run of the papers coming off the presses. Um, the building is, all the presses have been taken out of the building. We're now um, printing the paper down in Fremont where the Chronicle is printed. Paul, ex excuse me just a sec, Paul. Sure. Um, I forgot to mention to folks, if you have questions for Paul during the presentation, please put them in the chat and uh, I'll keep it on the chat and pass the questions on as we go forward. And then hopefully we'll have a little time at the end for some, some live Q&A, but don't hesitate to uh, put some put comments or questions in the chat as we go forward. Thank yeah, you, Paul, sorry about that. No, yeah, I'd be happy to inter ask and answer any questions during the, or have a conversation about anything during the uh, chat. Um, this is when the Kings were first allowing fans back into the game. So they put all, before they had the fans and they had all these cutouts of players. And this is like with the, one of the Sacramento King announcer, they had him in, sitting in all the chairs. So this is the first time the fans have, were actually allowed back into the building to watch a game. And we covered the governor's race and this is Catlin Jenner, former, um, uh, I guess, um, former Bruce Jenner Olympic athlete running for governor in California. So this year I went to the Tokyo Olympics, uh, my 10th game, this is the opening ceremony. Very different Olympics. They did not allow any fans inside any of the venues. Um, you really couldn't even tell that we're that, the, that there was an Olympics going on. Um, There's no really signage outside any of the, uh, outside on the streets anywhere in Tokyo. The, it was not that crowded. There was not that many people really on the streets of Tokyo. Um, so I'm just gonna, usually when we cover the Olympics, there's like your elbow to elbow with photographers, like um, like for the swimming venue, you have to have a ticket to get into the venue. And then there's seating on side of one side of the pool and then another side of the pool and there's a couple of other different areas. Usually like the wire services like Getty and AP and the Japanese wire service, they all have like pretty much prime positions. They're all wired in there with their cameras. So they're sending pictures right away. Um, I'm a little more independent, so I'm just uh, shooting the event and then downloading the pictures from the event right after the event and then uploading the pictures. Um, US, gold, US uh, guys, they uh, won the gold in the backstroke reacting. So Simone Biles, the Olympic Gymnast was the really big story. I think I missed a picture. Anyway, she was the very big story of the Olympics. Olympic medalist. Um, so this is the first jump she did. And then after this, she stopped. She felt not right and she stopped competing in her, her, in her event. And she was pretty upset. And this is right after she did that one jump and that was it. And that we thought that was the last we we're going to see of her during the whole Olympics. But she did come back a few days, uh, like a few days later, to compete in the balance beam. And this is her getting prepared to do her event. Um, she performed her event, and 
And even when you get to these events, you have to have a ticket to get in the building. And even when you're in the building, we all had to be separated at least six feet apart from each other wearing a mask uh, because the, the visual optics of the Olympics of the TV panning, you know, looking at from behind behind the athletes, you would see people. So you, the optics was you needed to show everybody six feet apart in mask. And even to get to position, you had to get there hours early just to get a position, a shooting position, um, wherever you wanted to try to be. And she landed her jump and she was so happy. And she actually won the bronze medal for um, in the balance game. And it was really hard. It was trying to show, trying to show the, um, the games with no fans in the stands. I mean, you might see a few people there, but that might be some media guys or just some support staff. And this is the men's uh, 10,000 meter run. And this is the start of the uh, women's 100 meter run. They did this really cool, um, they darkened the stadium, did this whole slideshow on, and projection video, video projection on, on the track, which I couldn't see from my position, but they made this really dramatic uh, start of the race. Um, this woman, she came back, set an Olympic record and won the, the gold medal in the triple jump. This is the first transgender weightlifter, um, Laurel Hubbard from uh, New Zealand who was competing. And she tried to do her, her lifts, but she failed to complete any of her lifts. So she was out, but there's really big media interest in her being the first transgender athlete to uh, compete. And uh, skateboarding was new for this, for this year's Olympics. So this is one of the women um, skateboarders. And this is after the, um, again, trying to show nobody's there, it's just for made for TV now. Is, this is the uh, medal ceremony for the women's volleyball. And that's the US team uh, who won the gold um, on the medal. And this is the, uh, the winners for the uh, relay. And this is just when I got back from the Olympics, I had to go up the Caldor fire start up in the, the Sierras. And this is one of the first pictures I made coming back from the fires or coming back from the Olympics. And then uh, the, the um, vaccines came out, right? So up in Placer County, there was a protest of families and children not wanting to take the, the, uh, the vaccine before their kids go went back to school. And then this is one of the first kid vaccines in Yolo County in the Sacramento area. So we went and documented that. So I'm gonna talk a little about my project, um, Gambate, Legacy of an Enduring Spirit. And um, I want to thank uh, the, um, the East Bay Photo Collect uh, Collective for really sharing my work again. And I want to take you guys on this journey. I really want to reveal the mystery behind these historical photographs of Americans of Japanese ethnicity after President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 over 78 years ago, which incarcerated 120,000 Japanese Americans. I'm gonna play a little uh, movie for you. When I started as a photographer, my uncle Nobu, an artist in San Francisco, had told me that Dorothea Lang had photographed our family as they left Oakland, California for the Tampran Assembly Center in 1942. I've been working on this story since 2005, and it's been an, an incredible journey, searching for the identities and sharing the stories of all the Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. For many of my subjects, they hope something like this would never happen again to another ethnic group in the United States.
and sharing their stories would shed a light on this. I had to fight like hell for the right to fight for my own country. I was the only Japanese American to fly in B-29s and to bomb the mainland of Japan. Every morning you would pick up your clothes and at night you would deliver it. It grew up into the Mount Eden laundry. His dream of coming to the United States, his dream of making a life were totally dashed. Everything that has happened to me in my life has been influenced in some way because of my experience at camp. I'm not ever sure that certain things will never happen again. Come on. Hold on. Oops. Go on. It's not wanting to work. There we go. Oops, sorry. So in 1970, I didn't know. I started on this lifelong journey to uh, that was hidden to me from my parents. I learned about the Japanese incarceration in a history class in San Mateo. I was uh, 16 years old and I was just totally shocked because my parents and my grandparents, nobody ever spoke about this at home. So as I grew up, we would always drive past the Tanfran racetrack and which is now a shopping center in San Bruno. And that held over 7,800 Bay Area Japanese Americans, including my dad's family. And my folks would never talk about it. We'd be driving down to San Mateo to, to go visit relatives. This is the entry of the, you know, of the camp. And I was really um, shocked that my, I, you know, I, when I found out, I asked my parents, tell me about why, what happened? Why are you guys locked up? You guys are American citizens. How can they do this to you? And all they could really, they really didn't want to talk about it. They would just say, well, the food was bad. It was cold, but they wouldn't really talk about how they felt about inside their heart or how they, what they really felt about. Now, like I said, Tanfran is a big shopping center and, and the biggest memorial there is a sea biscuit statue. And ironically, during college, I worked at the J.C. Penney's there at Tamfran, uh, all during college. And later, my mom was work at the same J.C. Penney's. But built on that site, they live in these poorly built buildings. And these are the horse stalls that were already there at, the, at Tamfran, and they were converted into living quarters. And they're also built temporary um, uh, buildings on, on the racetrack. But I wondered how, how could 120,000 Japanese Americans, many of them, two thirds of them were American citizens, not one word was spoken about it. Maybe, you know, it was this Japanese concept of shikata ganai, which means it can't be helped. And I might have overheard like my parents speaking to other Japanese Americans when they went to the grocery store, hey, what camp were you in? And for me, it, I mean, that was like a really common bond for them, for that generation, my parents' generation. But you know, like these harsh conditions that we're, we've learned about, um, they never crossed my mind. And I was even like a Eagle Boy Scout and you know, camping was supposed to be fun. And, um, this book, I wanted to, oops, sorry, wanting to know more, I discovered this book called Executive Order 9066. And it was filled with many iconic images, many of them taken by Dorothea Lang, one of my most favorite um, documentary photographers. And it was produced by Macy and Richard Conrad, who were uh, Dorothea Lang's assistant. And it was really the first time I'd seen emotional images of the incarceration that really grabbed me. And like I said, many were taken by Dorothea Lang, and many of her pictures showed the humanity and suffering of people who looked just like me. And she had the ability to capture the moment when everybody's life changed and make you want to care. 
And many of her, her images were impounded by the government, so nobody ever saw them during World War II. But these images, they have be, really become the iconic image of the, of the Japanese American experience during World War II. And it really left this burning desire that carried me throughout my life to learn, discover, and share the story of the Japanese Americans of the Japanese American experience. I really wanted to learn of what my parents didn't speak about. My uncle Nobu, who was an artist in San Francisco and had encouraged my passion as a photographer. And really his greatest gift to me was when he told me our family had been photographed by Dorothea Lang as they left for camp. So in 1984, when I was working at the Examiner, I was, um, I was on the road with Gary Hart, who was running for president, and the campaign trail ended in Washington, D.C., so I had like a day. So I went to the National Archives and the Library of Congress searching for this photograph, and I didn't know what it was going to look like. All I know is that there was a photograph taken by Dorothea Lang. So this is a library, and this is the cart. So you'd order a cart, out would come in these boxes, and inside these boxes were these little contact sheets of, uh, of the four by five pictures she shot or the two and a quarter pictures with a caption on the back. And Dorothea Lang had photographed over 900 pictures. And what a mystery to look for these. And in this one photograph dated May 5th, 1942, my grandparents are smiling and saying goodbye to this woman and I'm like, Who's this woman? Later on, my dad told me, that's my dad, 14 years old, sitting on the right. My dad had told me that that was their family friend, Dorothy Hightower. And my grandfather had a dry cleaning business on Piedmont Avenue in Oakland, and they had to shut that down, and he never recovered from that. And my mom's family were farmers down in San Jose, and they were like truck farmers, so they just leased the land. Well, later on, I found four photographs of Dorothy Lang that had taken them of my family. Two at the bottom were my Aunt Kimiko. One of those pictures were in a big exhibit at the Smithsonian um, during the 90s. And in the upper right is a picture of the Tanfrano Library that my Uncle Novo helped establish there. And he also worked on a, a literary magazine in the camp called the um, um, uh, Tanfran Totalizer. And then when he, they went to the Topaz incarceration camp or concentration camp in Utah, he worked on a magazine called Trek Magazine. So that's my ma, my my um, my dad, and my aunt, photographed the same spot in Oakland, California, where they were taken in 1942. My dad, my aunt, my cousin, myself, my mom. Oops. So what's going on here? Sorry. So when I started this project, um, I wanted to shoot everything with a four by five camera and shoot film because I wanted my photographs to mimic and, and kind of have the same feeling as the photograph shot in, 19, in the 1940s. And when I started this project, I shot with, a, with type 55 Polaroid film and Polaroid was still making the film at the time. And then when they stopped, when they went out of business, I had to, uh, I shot, um, I bought film on eBay. And then when I started having problems with the film, I ended up switching to uh, T-Max uh, four by five film. And a friend of mine, Peter De Silva, hooked me over with a bunch of film holders. So when I started this project, many of these photographs, like this is like the one from the National Archives, had no ID, no IDs on them. So we didn't know who they were. So over the past 16 years, I've photographed and identified over 70 survivors. And this is the kind of information you see on the back of the photograph. They tell you the place, the date, and like there's a caption, but hardly any names were on the, or IDs were on the back of the photographs. And many of the people had scattered across the country and didn't return home or in some actually went back to Japan. 
So with a lot of detective work and really luck from so many people, I was able to identify uh, many of these photographs who were, well, I thought were the iconic photos and were some of my most favorite photographs. So this is one of my subjects, Fumiko Hayashida. And this is her on Bainbridge Island on her family farm. And I photographed her twice. And I met her other, her other family members who were in some of the other photographs. She was 95 at the, at the time I photographed her in 2006. And she was one of the lucky ones. She was a third generation Japanese American and she didn't, they came back and they did not lose their farm. And she lived till 103 years old and she became like an activist testifying to Congress. This is one of my favorite guys, Mitz Kojimoto. He was 85 years old at the time. And he was so humble and but he's so knowledgeable because he was a World War II combat veteran of the famed all Japanese American 442nd Combat Regiment. He was one of the most decorated uh, units in the world in World War II and in the Army history. And he was so humbled. He would he was collecting data and stories from all the guys who were in all the different units. But come to find out later, reading something, he was a, also a brand, Bronze Star Medal winner for bravery. And he, this is something he never told me about. But I ended up photographing him in San Francisco on Van Ness Avenue on the same spot where he was photographed in 1942. And this is the Tomini family photographed in, um, at the Alameda churches where they came back to after they returned from camp. And that's um, another Bayer photographer, Peter De Silva helping me out, Anna's son helped me out. Um, with the photograph. Um, one of the families in, in San Francisco, they, uh, this is the, one of the church families. Their, fam their father was arrested shortly after um, Pearl Harbor because he was a community leader and a church leader. And when I'm doing this project, besides shooting the film four by five, I'm also doing video interviews. So I would collect all, I would have questions, try to learn more family history so we could learn the mystery behind all these photographs. Um, this is this family. My dad told me about this family and said, yeah, we used to shop at their grocery store and that, they're, they're, these are the descendants of the, of their uncle who put the sign up, I'm an American, and their uncle was a student at UC Berkeley at the time. And they had to sell, sell the building or sell the business and they never recovered from that. Excuse me, Paul, do you, yes. uh, do you know the location? I mean, you obviously know the location yes. is, uh, of that previous. Yeah, I event. think it was on, um, I got it, don't, it's, I think it's like a ninth or 10th in Franklin. Mm -hmm. so right in Chinatown. So when we were doing the photograph, Peter was actually standing on this mailbox next to me, putting a reflector in there. And we were, there was people walking back and forth between the camera and the subjects. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I thought, I thought that the chase, that building looked familiar. Yeah. So, I, and I've, of course, I've seen the historic photo many, many, many times. Yeah. And I, it's, it's pretty interesting to see that actual location. And of course, the folks descendants of that man it's incredible and like the descendants say too a lot of them like their folks didn't talk about it and even from you know they their folks never talked about their experience and stuff too so they were they didn't know as much as you know they wanted to either um her mom was a very famous watercolor so this is in hayward california on c street and this is um Ibuki Hiba, and um, that's her holding her little doll there in 1942. Her dad was also like a famous watercolor artist and her dad and mom also started like in Tanfran and in Topaz, the other camp, they started like an art school. So these three guys, it took me three years to photograph them, find them all and photograph them. I found one guy and then took me two years and I found the second guy and then 
Finally, I found the third person. So I drove down to LA to photograph him. I picked one guy up we, and I picked him up, picked another guy up and brought him to this third guy's house and um, photographed him there on the site. And they hadn't seen each other in years. And when I photographed them, my two guys live within a mile each other. And I go, don't you, I, I was so surprised because it took me so long to find all three. And they kind of knew each other. So it's like, I was like, wow, you guys live so close. And like, I couldn't believe how close you look. And then after we photographed them, I wanted to take them all out to dinner and, and just let them reminisce or anything. But they go, nah, can you just take me home? So I ended up just going out to lunch with one of the guys. So this is um, Lillian Katsumoto, and she was a social worker. She went to UC Berkeley, um, fought to get a master's degree in social work in the 30s. And she convinced the school that there was going to be a need for social workers in the growing Japanese American community. In the early part of 1940, we started asking questions of the government, you know, how are you going to move 50 children? Where are we going to go? Because if all the Japanese community was gone, just Japanese children living here and there, they may not even be able to go to school. Uh, right to Manzanar, it's about four hours from LA. And she was only four years old. And she sang, God bless America. This soldier that was sitting, guarding us, I could see tears running down. He was really overcome by this little you're all singing that song. And this is uh, Kiyoshi Katsumoto. He lives in um, um, El Cerrito. Well, we had our, our constitutional rights taken away from us, and I just felt really bad that uh, our own government would do something like that to us. The family number we were given, given was 21365. And that's what we were reduced to this uh, uh, our number. If any name you want to give it, it was still a concentration camp. I, I mean, we were prisoners. We we did not have free freedom to go and, and walk wherever we wanted to. We were confined within the borders of the barbed wire and guard towers. So for many people, this is the first time they'd share their story with somebody outside their family. And a lot of them, like their kids, like the older people, they would ask me to ask for the transcript because they wanted to know what their parents had, hadn't talked to them about. And some of these people were school teachers like my dad and uncles, others were farmers like my mom's family. I've met doctors, scientists, engineers, lawyers, housewives, businessmen, social workers, musicians and artists, resistors volunteers who volunteer for the army. Yes, yes, no, no, there's a loyalty question. And collaborating and having all these people share their stories, we could, we were able to reveal the mysteries behind all these historical photographs. And this is one of my favorite images of Dorothea Lange. Um, this was taken in San Francisco. Um, and the girls saying the Pledge of Allegiance with all their other schoolmates just before they were to be locked behind Bob Wire. And 65 years later in 2007, this is the first time Helen Miyahara and Marianne Yahiro had seen each other since 1942. And I really, I learned that um, Helena's family had owned the grocery store where my mom shop for Japanese food in San Francisco, which was called the American fish market was on Post Street and Buchanan. But both had parents arrested by the FBI shortly after the start of World War II. And Mary Ann's mom was teaching Japanese language. And so her mom was arrested, but she was never to see her mom alive again. Her mom died in a separate camp. And this is Mitz Kojimoto. This is the 2020 Venice Avenue in San Francisco. I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. And my mother and I were really shocked that uh, such a thing could happen. The big day of our young lives were we were being kicked out of San Francisco. 
it's kind of shocking because as you grow up, you think you're going to have to have certain rights of life, liberty. We were citizens, but now we were not being treated so harshly was very heartbreaking. Um, this is Walter Sockaway, and it took me over 14 years to find him. This is one of uh, another one of my favorite iconic um, Dorothy Lang photographs. This was taken in Manzanar, uh, the incarceration camp, which is kind of by Death Valley in the Eastern Sierras. And I thought this photo would be, so many people have seen this picture and it would be easy to find the idea that, of the family here, but it took me forever. And finally, the park ranger at Manzanar said, I think I know who that person is. And he gave me the name. And I thought, well, the spelling's really different from what I thought it should be. But I put it in Google and wow, I still look at all of a sudden this name and this address and phone number popped up. So I gave this Walter a call in Texas of all places. And I said, are you the kid in this picture from Manzanar? And he says, yes, I am. And I said, well, I'd really like to come and photograph you and interview you. And, um, and luckily I, he said yes, and I flew out to, to Texas to go photograph him. And here's his story. And he was a uh, trucker in Venice, California, hauling all the uh, produce from the fields there to the market downtown. The property they didn't lose, but when they came back, I think Paul's sound went off and I think that was my fault. So, uh, I'm gonna pause the presentation for just a sec. And Paul, you are back. I accidentally turned off the sound and muted you. And so we missed the sound here. Can we go back? So you're still muted, unfortunately. All right, I think you're back. He was a uh, thank you in Venice, California, hauling all the uh, produce from the fields there to the market downtown. The property they didn't lose, but when they came back, everything was gone. As, as, a, as an individual, now if they tried to pull off now. I, I, I don't think I would cooperate. <laughs> You talk to people nowadays, or the younger, especially the younger people, they don't know what you're talking about. Well, internment camp, what, what's that? I think it's important for them to know that this thing did happen. And uh, certainly hope that it never happens again to anyone. I learned that this is another Dorothy Lang photograph, and I found that his name was actually in the back of the photograph and had learned that Harvey Aitano here had helped mankind with the discovery of the genetic cause of sickle cell anemia with Linus Pauling at Caltech. And he was very shy, um, really didn't want to talk about himself, but he, would, he knew about a lot of the people in Sacramento. He was from Sacramento. And I photographed him at his home in San Diego after many requests to see him. And like I said, he was very shy, but he could talk about other people at ease, but not his own achievements and the good he did for mankind. And um, at the time I photographed, technically, I, I um, asked him to sit very still during this one to two second exposure with the Polaroid film. And this is Yuki Llewellyn, one of my first subjects. And this is out in Manzanar. And this I is a, was born on Cracker Street in Little Tokyo. Went to camp, and from camp went to Cleveland, Ohio. I remember that my mom said that my dad had died in the war. And I didn't know what that meant, if he was in the war or during the war, you know, why she said that. When I went to camp, it was just my mother and me but when I went back to, to Manzanar to check out my records and things, 
I found out that she indeed had the Okinaga last name. She had the Hayakawa last name. And she had entered Manzanar with a man and me, but it was not my father. My father was in Manzanar, but I didn't know that until I was an adult. I wanted some kind of memory to come flooding back to me just by being there and it didn't come. I still have it in my room, as a matter of fact, um, sand from the area. They said, this is where your block was, but I didn't get any feeling of memory. I'm not ever sure that certain things will never happen again, just because they were horrific just because they were terrible, because they impacted badly on our people. She thought that it ruined her life, that she came to the United States for a better life. She never got it and blamed the war and camp. Everything that has happened to me in my life has been influenced in some way because of my experience at camp. This is uh, Mason Tachibana. This is an Ansel Adams photograph. He was um, he was uh, friends with the superintendent of Manzanar, so he was allowed to come down there, and he photographed um, a Manzanar. And his collection of photographs is actually in the Library of Congress, and he produced a book of the photographs and um, and it's being republished today by um, City Files Press. But he's standing outside the Catholic Church here in Manzanar. And I, and um, which really crazy, I, I had I had to photograph Mason three times and I photographed him in Berkeley because he came to visit his son. And the first time I photographed him, um, when I drove home, I the Polaroid film, the emulsion slid off the, the film. So I had nothing. So I called him back and said, can I get back and photograph you? Yeah. Was there a question? No, it was just a, a moan of commiseration. <laughs> yeah, so I, cause I, I put water on the, the film right away. And then by the time I got home, everything just slid off. So I wouldn't photograph him again and at the time I was using film I was buying on eBay, a lot of outdated film. So I got back and I looked at my negatives. I'm like, God, everything was not focused. Is it my eyes, the camera? Got the camera, went to this repair shop, see if it's my camera, my eyeballs or whatever. And I discovered that the film was buckling in the holder when I pulled the, the Polaroid film was buckling when I was pulling the slide. So it lose focus. So I photographed them one, one more time, luckily everything worked out. And but uh, Mason just recently passed away a few few months ago. There's just... seven when uh, we went into camp. January, we went in February, so I was six at that time. It's my sister in the back, uh, sister Susanna, sister Bernadette, the gruff one. Mother and father never went to church, but they were Buddhists. They sent us to Marino because. Uh, they taught uh, Japanese language over there. And my father and mother never learned how to speak English. We went to Marino. I remember school was kind of happy there. You know, it was, there was some joy there. I remember coming home from the bus, it was kind of lighthearted. And, but uh, it was maybe the last time I sensed any kind of I didn't know this was going to get me. I never thought of that like this. So then it was into uh, camp after that and uh, just any kind of joy or good times just, just stopped, I think. I didn't think of this before. That time and the time just went just just changed. So in that way, there no Catholic Church. Uh, they were they were very important to us. 
when I was talking to Mason during the photos or during the interview, I was asking him, he became a social worker. And I said, do you think your experience being in camp um, led you to be a social worker? And then he thought about it. He goes, you know, I never thought about it, but he goes, you know, maybe because when they got out of camp, they had to live in these, another terrible place in these trailers in Burbank, these temporary trailers, which was actually even worse than uh, Manzanar, the camp. And, but they'd have a social worker come out there and visit the family. The first time his dad had ever been on welfare. And they were kind of embarrassed about that. And, but he said that social worker really helped them. So I said, well, maybe did that help you choose who you wanted to be to help other people? And he thought that could have been the case. So it took me over seven years to find my first 12 subjects who were, who were displayed here in the San Bruno BART station, which is at the Tanfran racetrack. Tanfran Shopping Center, which is where the incarceration camp was in the Bay Area. And this was displayed on, at, in the San Bruno BART station on the 70th anniversary of Executive Order 9066 in 2012. And what's so cool about this exhibit, it was a one month exhibit and it's turned into a permanent exhibit there. Um, and what's really incredible is that this uh, committee form, a nonprofit form, called the Tanfran Memorial Assembly Center um, Memorial Committee. And with that, they apply for grants and I was able to photograph more people, create, an, create a bigger exhibit. And, um, and since then, they've also applied for another grant and they've created a, um, this plaza here, which is gonna be a memorial plaza right outside the BART station. And it's gonna have everybody's name there. There's more history of of what happened here on this site and the inside and the inside, this inside thing is gonna be all redone with um, historical panels, more informational uh, stories of what happened here. And that's in the midst of being constructed this year. But I've really been amazed at how much time people view the exhibits, reading the stories of the subjects. And some, some of the viewers have told me, this is in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. This is at Fort Snelling, which was a former camp where the military intelligence service was for the Japanese Americans. So all the Japanese Americans who volunteered for the army, they were translators. They would, um, some of them were in the battlefields in the Pacific on Iwo Jima and all the other Burma all over the Pacific Islands because they would interrogate prisoners read documents and they really help with the war effort. But this is the location where the school was, where they all trained before they went overseas. But what's really amazing is that um, how much time really people spent reading the story. I was told people would just want a small caption, but people would really just stand there and read, find out you know, really who the people were in these historical photographs and really what happened to them. Because many of them were like people like me, Japanese Americans, and they wanted to know what happened with their families. And this is, a, I had a projection at the International Center of Photography in New York, but um, really this is an American story. You know, ethnic Japanese were rounded up by Americans. They're forcibly confined in American prison camps, guarded by armed Americans with their guns pointing in, not out to protect them. And after World War II, the incarcerated people returned through to their to their American communities, and sometimes they face our hostilities there. There's like no Jap wanted signs posted in a lot of places, and they had to overcome a lot more just to to integrate back in society. So in 1988, America formally formally express regret for the violation of their rights as American citizens. And, um, and they, for, they formally apologize and, and there was reparations that um, helped, you know, that gave them money back for being incarcerated. But in the following six years since the first exhibit in 2012, I added over 48 more subjects I had found for a total of 60 who were exhibited here at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles in 2018 to 2019. And, uh, and I continue adding um, 
more body of work. I have five more people I've uh, photographed and I'm still working on to add to the exhibit. And I'm still trying to get more funding. And I'm also trying to, since so many of my subjects, a lot of them have passed away already. Um, and there's so many harder to find so many of these other subjects. A lot of them, they're, when I photographed them, they were 80 and 90 years old and a lot of them have gone. So, and um, so I'm trying to do work on another project doing artifacts of the 10 different campsites and the assembly center sites which were all over the, the um, West Coast and find artifacts that were still left there and, and do tell the story with the artifacts. So I was able to create this book um, behind Bob Wire, which has all the paired photograph with all the text and the stories in the backgrounds of all the photograph of the people in the stories. And um, we've sold out of the first edition and we have a second edition out that's still selling. Um, but I think really what I really want to do is create this, besides the exhibit, is create a book which can be put in libraries or could be shared with different people of different generations. It's like older people, they're not as computer savvy. So here we have something hard that we could maybe share with their family or other people. So we could keep these uh, the Japanese experience alive. So we'll always remember and never forget. And as Walter Sockway said, so many, so many people don't believe or know that this happened in America. And let's not let history repeat itself. So in the 15 years I spent on this project, there's, it's been a really big journey filled with beautiful, sometimes painful recollections filled by the generosity of so many people who helped me identify and track down, down those sent to the camps and their descendants. And I really wanna thank my grandfather's, grandparents, Issei generation, and my parents, Nisei generation for their perseverance and really overcoming all their hardships in their lives. You know, really without all their uh, struggles and strength, my my generation, Sansei, third, third generation, and then my kids and my grandchildren's generation wouldn't have the opportunities they have today without all the battles that our ancestors won with their sweat, tears, and quiet strength. And in looking for the Japanese word that captures the strength and spirit of those who survived that, that experience, I found it in the word Gambate, which means triumphing, triumphing, triumphing over adversity, never giving up, and always trying to do one's best. It's come to define not only their spirit in this work, but also my life. And these are a few of their stories so that we will all remember them always. So thank you for um, listening to me and Share, let me share my work and hopefully you could go online or oh yeah my exhibit just finished at the California Museum in Sacramento I was there for four months it just finished in November and it's heading up to Portland to the Portland Historical Society which will be there from for next year or for this year from uh, May to October so maybe uh, you'll be able to go there and besides just seeing the photographs on the wall we also have audio so if you're standing in front of a few of the photographs, you could actually hear like the subject speak like you heard on some of the pres presentations here. Wow. So I guess we could sh stop sharing the screen and then we could do a little Q&A or else we could let the slideshow play in the background of the pairs. Um, yeah, uh, Paul, I was just, maybe we'll stop sharing the screen for the moment. Okay. Um, and the uh, my recommendation is because those images are so powerful um, and uh, it's um, you know, uh, Let's see you know just this just, just really can't can't let go but it, it's um, really um, uh, um, such incredible emotional presentation that you've taken us to and, and it's Nice to kind of stop and sure. I'll let take you let the screen stop screen. Uh, okay, I can't touch it on the. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so now we got we got Paul front and center, and thank you so much. Like I was saying, um, 
that was, you know, we can all take a breath. Uh, we've gone through really terrific uh, emotional experience where you've taken us and to see um, those faces, you know, those young faces going into the unknown and, the, and to see the, you know, the faces later and, and to see that history, you know, literally written in those faces. Uh, it's just a completely unique experience for me. So thank you so much. And um, there's a couple of good, couple of questions uh, I'll just toss out. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer Allen mentioned early on, some of the very early images that we saw, the Dorothy Lang images, uh, we saw folks who were lined up and they had tags on their clothing. And but what is that? Why are they, why do they have tags? Yeah, so it's really, really disheartening because everybody had a tag with a number on it. So everybody was like, um, what's the right word? Everybody, was, everybody had a tag with a number so that went on your clothing and also with your luggage. You're only allowed to carry two pieces of luggage or whatever you could carry to the camp, to the bus, to, to the camp. So everybody had a number and everybody was still distilled a number. To me, it's kind of like, it's really terrible because it's kind of like, you're not a name, you're not a person, you're a number. It's kind of like, almost like Auschwitz, you know, where they had everybody tattooed with a number. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort so of- So it's at that, that kind of mark. And, and you had an image of one of the tags at the end. Yes. Is that some of your finding yeah, of artifacts? So one of, one of the images that I don't, my parents, my family never had a tag, but that's one of the tags from Sotsky Ina. She's in East Bay. She's a filmmaker. She's done two films on the incarceration. She runs this uh, other program called uh, Pseudo for Solidarity, mm -hmm. activism thing on Japanese American uh, in incarceration. And that's her family tag mm -hmm. that I photographed. Mm -hmm. um, and I photographed, there's a picture of her. There's two photographs of her mom. There's one of her mom in San Francisco waiting to get information about going to camp. And then there's another image of her father inside a jail in Tule Lake, which is in Northern California by Klamath Falls. It's, so he's in a jail within a jail. And there's a picture there and I had and I'd photographed Sotsky inside that same jail cell in, during one of the pilgrimages. But yeah, the numbers were very, it just made somebody a person, not a person, but a number. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so Renee asks, um, you know, obviously there's an incredible commitment on your part uh, to this project. And you mentioned some grants that you had along the way, but, but it, yeah, in general, how, how was this funded? And, and you know, I, how did you get started on this? Um, you know, I, I've always wanted, I've I worked in San Francisco, the SF Examiner, the San Francisco mm -hmm. Mercury News. I'd done like stories there for the, for the newspaper on the Japanese internment incarceration, but um, I never did something that was my own. And these photographs, when I was looking back at the National Archives, flipping through these boxes of um, the Dorothy Lang images, mm -hmm. all those faces were staring up at me. And, and they're so haunting, you know what I mean? I really wanted to know who they were, what happened to them, you know? And that's always stuck in my brain and in my heart. And, you know, like the first time I learned about it when I was 16 in high school, you know, you're in high school, you're kind of like a hothead. You're like, how can they do this? You know, this is BS, you know? And that's, but I'm, it's just always stuck in me how, how unfair that was. And um, so as I, I was up in Seattle, came back to the Bay Area to be close to my folks, help my folks up. But um, at the SAC B, I, I'd seen this one, you know, it's really, Michael Williamson was a photographer the second one of B. He and his other reporter did a, a book on with the old um, FSA photographs. And he, they tracked the before and after kind of mm -hmm. thing families. And that kind of like, kind of like, well, I could probably do that, but I thought it'd be really easy. So the first time I did this, my, I took those famous, my favorite images for that, from that book, made blow ups, put a poster board on this board and I took it to this Japanese church Buddhist temple in Sacramento because I ran the Bay Area and everywhere else. The Japanese temples always have a summer festival so everybody comes in, there's food, you know, mm -hmm. you get and games and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And everybody from the community and outside the community comes in. 
So I figured, oh, this is going to be awesome. There's some like Sacramento people in these photographs. Put my business card there. Call me, please. You know. So the festival happens, and I did gotten up one call. I'm like, oh man, this is terrible. So I said, so I talked to somebody else in the community. And they said, well, they suggested, you know, there's this Japanese American Methodist church in the area. They have a lunch for the seniors. Why don't you take it down there? So I took the same board down there and trot it down there and like put it up. And they go, oh, I know who that is. Uh, so yeah. I had my first clue, my first name. And then uh, I'm like, you have a phone number. <laughs> <laughs> so it started from that. Mm -hmm. And that's so I took that's how it started. Just taking it to different places. Say, do you know who this is? Because when I started this, Google is very getting started through so the worst of the search engines to find stuff. Mm -hmm put stuff out there so it's really word of mouth and just asking people that's why it took me over seven years until 2012 to find those first 12 people mm -hmm. just took so long and then after that um the the story is published in the sacramento b and in and in the san francisco chronicle and then from there i got a little more hits and then we had the exhibit there at the at the bart station and just kind of snowball mm -hmm. from there and every time i have another exhibit or a talk somewhere i bring more photographs I said, anybody recognize anything? And, you know, that's how it worked. And that's why it took so long. And you were, did you initially uh, self-funded when you first started? Yeah, self-funding. When I first started, I got a one little small grant from the National Press Photographers Association, mm -hmm. which actually helped me buy some film. And, um, but largely self-funded until I, later on after the first exhibit, at the bar station, then we got some more funding and I was able to use that to mm -hmm. do some more research, create the exhibit and go from there. I'm so excited to hear that that show was a springboard for a memorial uh, out there. And, you know, your initial image of the horse statue at Tanferan, you know, and of course I know the history of Tanferan and that just never connected to me how shocking it is that there's a statue of a horse there, but there's no other history. There's no yep. other recognition of this important history. You know, in that same parking lot, back in 1979, there's a park, there's a thing about this big on the ground you can never find if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. I went to my first, um, not a pilgrimage, but they had this first like remembrance thing there. I think it was 1978 or so. I went 78, I think it was in 78, 77 there. And I went there with my dad and my uncle. It was the first time they ever remembered there. It's like, so we went there and and um, that was that small little thing, and then the sea biscuit there, and then and then it's really incredible that from this this man Richard Oba, who was in the Bay Area, saw the story in the Chronicle, contacted me. Hey, would you like to exhibit for this Asian Pacific History Month with Bart for one month? I go, sure, let's let's do it. So that's how that started. And then it just snowballed into this group getting together, seeing the value of the story. And I, I think wanting to honor every, all, everybody in the Bay Area, because mostly everybody in the Bay Area went through Tanferan. And I think it's just an incredible thing that we're honoring our, our ancestors who went through this terrible part of history. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Saul uh, um, just maybe talk a little bit about the experience of shooting portraits in four by five and your you know your practice for these versus your regular news gig uh yeah. what was how is it different for you i work a lot slower uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> i make a lot more mistakes <laughs> you know um how, how many how many images would you shoot at a, a one of these portrait sessions um i'd shoot like a box of 20 Mm -hmm. try to shoot something wide I should try to shoot a really tight portrait sometimes I shoot 30 I mean I because the film was so expensive and I just tried not and, and even that's probably I was probably shooting too much because I'm used to shooting 35 millimeter mm -hmm. shooting, I'm, I mean originally before mm -hmm. we full you know film 36 exposures per roll and now we shoot digital we could shoot as much as we want but um I just slow down, you know, remember to pull the slide, remember to put the slide back in, mm -hmm. lock the shutter without pulling, you know, before you pull the slide. And, and then originally I was using no lights and then eventually I started um, supplementing lights either with a reflector or 
using a strobe or to supplement the light. But yeah, shooting four by five is a lot slower process. And trying to figure out how you're gonna, I guess the hardest thing was when I, when I arrived at the subject's house, I never knew I was gonna find there. And I was trying to find something that would kind of mimic the historical picture. And I'm not sure what it was at the house. And I wanted the, the photograph to kind of mimic whatever the historical picture was. And it's very hard because a lot of times I wasn't photographing in the same location. And uh, many of the times I wasn't. So maybe there's some object in the house or something that kind of felt something kind of Japanese or something that kind of, and I try to incorporate that in the image in, in the portrait session. Okay, let me ask you something then. So an image that we just saw that you had an interview with the man and it was one where he got quite upset and he was talking about yeah. his memories and right. I guess he became a social worker. Is that yeah, the same that's guy? Him. And yeah. you photographed him three times. <laughs> uh, he's standing behind a fence. Yes. And so that, you know, very, uh, that symbolism was not lost to me. I mean, that hit me like a ton of bricks and yeah. Um, maybe you can, you know, I, I won't say it's obvious, but it's simple and incredibly effective. You know, your choice of how to set up and pose him. Yeah, I tried to find something that would, I think symbolism is so important, mm -hmm. portraits, especially when you're not photographing them in the same location or, but in some of the other portraits I've done, I, I used the shadow to show the same sort of, um, hard lines, you know what I mean, which would be like a fence or, you know, the same sort of lock behind something, you know, that same kind of symbolism. Mm. But yeah, I always look for some kind of symbolism or something that would kind of show that. I mean, we didn't want to photograph inside the house because it was his son's house, it wasn't his home. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing there that's personal of his that would incorporate. So doing that outside was, was seemed like the solution for that, mm -hmm. for that image. It was, uh, I mean, among so many powerful images and powerful moments, that one was quite, and of course, having him speak over it and really hearing, you know, his emotions, correct, and then, you know, connecting with the emotions in the image, uh, it really was uh, an amazing moment for me. Yeah, I think their voices are so important, especially to hear their timbre of the voice, just their emotion of their voice. Mm -hmm. You could write it, you could read it, and that's emotional, but God, just to hear it with the photograph, with the images, it's like, mm -hmm. for me, it's just so powerful. Okay, let's uh, clean it's it up. Me, it's not me in the photograph, it's them. And mm -hmm. It's not about me, it's them telling their story what happened. I think that's so important. Cleaning up the questions here. Uh, you did mention that as that you've been kind of able to leverage on each exhibition, you get a little more word of mouth, you get a little more, uh, a few more connections and, and find some more people. Yeah, um, I think that I've exhibited um, across the US. I'm still finding, looking for more venues. I'm trying to get it like in the South, like in, you know, or the Midwest. And I mean, just more places. I'm still trying to get it in the Bay Area. I had like a couple pieces in this exhibit that was at the Presidio. Um, it's been like two years now. I'm still trying to find another venue in the Bay Area too. But mm -hmm. um, boy, I wish I knew a gallery in the Bay Area that was interested. Because in... there's so many people in the Bay Area, you know. Uh -huh. I mean? Great. But, well, um, let's let's talk. Uh, let's but, see. But it's shown <laughs> across the U.S. in different places. I mean, it's been in Arizona, Minnesota. Um, it was just in New Jersey. A couple of pieces were in New Jersey at a, a group show. I mean, yeah. It's just been all over. So I mean, is I think for most of the subjects, I think what most of them have all said is they want this never to happen to any, anybody else. And they really want the story to get out. So this doesn't really happen to anybody else. There's, um, uh, where can folks find your book? Um, right now you can find it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it's at right now. Okay, uh, let's see. There's a couple of long comments. Neely um, wants to talk to you about some educational materials. Neely's uh, on our board and I'm gonna 
tell you folks to, to hook up and communicate rather than me reading some long stuff. Uh, Saul, do you want to jump in with questions, comments? Saul, we can't quite hear you. You know so, what, Vince? Mm -hmm. So, like, I mean, the whole time I was doing this, I was still working full time at the Sacramento Bee. So I take my vacation time or my days off and go off and find people. My boss there, Mark Morris, was very kind and let me have time off, and he helped support me too. Oh, fantastic! Uh, time and stuff, and I had a lot of support from a lot of different people. I mean, um, um, former reporter I worked with. Um, oh gosh. Sorry. You know, people, a lot of different people have helped me different ways, mm -hmm. librarians and trying to research and find people and yeah. stuff like that. Did, did the bee run any of it? Was there any opportunity? Yes, the, for... so the bee ran the first part of the story, first story on, on the anniversary, which was on um, April 9th, or I'm sorry, February 19th, uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, what I was going to tell you who helped me a lot with, with, more, with my writing was Pat Yolen, former colleague at the San Francisco Examiner, and then she worked in NPR in the Bay, Bay Area. And uh, she recently passed it last year or so. But she was very helpful with me. Um, let's see, Paul, there is a comment here from Jeffrey Thomas Allen who says, you brought up, up the Tomini family Yes. I'm assuming your subject was Ina Shizuku, grandmother of Adrian Tumini. Oh, hold on. I don't have the name in front of me. I'm sorry. Okay. But I did photograph the Tomini family. I, there's a, the historical picture has the grandmother and then a family friend down there in the Centerville, which is Fremont that I mm -hmm. leaving to go to camp. And I forgot how I found them, but I end up photographing the whole family. Um, one of the uh, four kids uh, just recently passed away last year. Um, um, so, so this is really urgent business to capture these these voices. Oh, no, so urgent, but then it's so hard to, I mean, even to convince somebody to open up and talk about their experiences so hard because you know Japanese culture you really don't talk about what's inside here you don't mm -hmm. really share that um I mean first time I was making phone calls it's like please don't hang up with me I'm not a salesman you're in this photograph I'd like to photograph you which is tough enough and then I'd like to interview which is even tougher well I don't want to talk about it you know so it was it was very challenging to get people to help I mean, for them to talk to me and let me photograph them and share their stories, but I'm, they were so brave to do all that and just to share their stories. But Neely says that, um, that you know, your story of, of a family not discussing what happened, it's one that she's heard from a friends who had older family members who were incarcerated. We visited an exhibit at Presidio in 2018 and my friend found her family members in a big book and until that time, she did not even have any idea what camp her family had been sent to. Yeah, I mean, for my, for I have my first exhibit, big exhibit was at the California Museum in 2015. And I had 30 pictures at that point. And so this, people came through and then there's this group, this reporter who worked in Stockton, he came through, saw the picture of my grandparents, historical picture, in the background was his uncle and his father. Oh, wow. And he never knew that family uh -huh. picture had, had existed. Oh my. And serendipitously, his family, his mom had settled in Auburn, which is just west of Sacramento. And he married somebody who, and when I first moved here, I drove to Auburn and there was like this Japanese grocery store. I'm like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> and then I find out years later, that's the same family. So I photographed them at the location of that um, um, grocery store in, in Auburn. And the Tomini family is related to Satsuki Ina family. There's a relationship there with different marriages and stuff. And then there's another photograph I shot of um, the Sacramento Buddhist temple. And there's a family, 
in San Francisco. And her father was a reverend, but they're related. She got married to Tomini. <laughs> so yeah. there's all these cross, like three photographs had an intersection of relationships. So we got sent this link. Yes, that's Satsuki Hina's mom on the left. Actually, let me show you. Let me go to my share thing. Let me just show you. Can you mm -hmm. share? Let me just show you the pair. Come on. Where's my keynote? Sorry. Let me get out of this navigator. Hold on. Shoot. Sorry. Give me one second. Sorry. Okay. So this image is Satsuki and his father in the jail. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And then hold so on. this this is the jail and within that, the jail. This is yeah, the... that's Satsuki in, in the jail. Oh my. And then that other picture you just showed me, that's her mom in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Oh my. Yeah. Yeah. Jeffrey Thomas Allen, thank you for bringing that up. Um um so some some of these photos are not all Dorothy Lang. There's a few Ansel Adams photographs in there. Um, Have you shown any work in Japan? No, I'd like to. I've been trying to. I've been in a couple of the Japanese newspapers, but not in not in an exhibit. So there's another photographer who works with the Chronicle, Leah Suzuki. So one day on Facebook, I see she posted this picture of her family taken by Ansel Adams in the camp. I'm like, Leah, why don't you tell me? Wow. So I photographed her, her parents who the same kids in that one photograph right here wow. in San Francisco. Um, yeah. So as we could, Um, and if you didn't know, there was like this gentleman here was from Sacramento and he played in the jazz bands. He, he brought his drums up. His dad has a drum set up to Thule Lake and played all the jazz bands. And he's a musician until mm -hmm. later in life. He came wow. out, st settled in LA, played drums, trumpet. Oh my God, what a picture. That, that fade effect is very moving. And uh, because we have this anticipation of, you know, where, what are we, where are we going to go? Where are we going to see? Yeah. And uh, and I think your skill in posing people is is fantastic. And it, it's you know, it's just... like a it's a collaboration with the subject too. You mm -hmm. know, just, yeah. Um, but the amazing thing is these three guys and not talking to each other and. This is an Ansel Adams photograph. And what's interesting is this woman, she talked about her about the internment with her kids, and she also started a school down in San Jose teaching about the internment so no more people would know about it. And so this wouldn't happen again. Mm -hmm. So um I'll stop the uh, stop uh the how um what's what was the process of getting access to those original images? Well, the images are in the National Archives, mm -hmm. so you could go back there and get them. They're part of the public domain. Okay, so do they have scans that you can access? Or? There are some scans. I mean, they digitalize some of it. Some of the digitalized versions are not so good. And, mm -hmm. to, and to search from online, they haven't digitalized everything. Right. But there's a, if somebody's interested, I could send you a link for that. And there's mm -hmm. also... Ansel Adams' work, which is in the uh, Library of Congress, too. Okay. There's some work in the Library of Congress of Dorothy Lang. She just, it's hard to find. Mm. The easiest way is if you took a trip there and went through, there's over 6,000 images in the National Archives. Well, I guess, yeah, her work would be Besides public domain her, since she was, she was paid by the government to take those pictures. So. Right, and then she quit. Uh -huh. and, and then when she and, was photographing, too, <clears throat> she had a hard time photographing because a lot of the military guys and the officials didn't like her photographing, so they would hamper her work. 
And I think that's a lot of the reason why there's no IDs in a lot of the pictures because they mm -hmm. need to move along mm -hmm. right away. And so were you, did you do your own scans or prints of the Dorothea Lang work? Or? So my scanning mm -hmm. was done by my friend, Chris Hardy, who's a former photographer at the San Francisco Examiner Chronicle. Mm -hmm. And then he did my scanning for me. And then uh, we, we printed at a lab here in Sacramento. Yes. And printed and framed up here, so. Well, there's some suggestions for other places that might be interested in exhibiting your work. And I'll just, I'll put you in touch with folks okay. that are oh, in, in the you. chat here. Um, but it's really interesting the past few years with, um, well, ever since 9-11, all the Japanese Americans, I think, have been speaking out because they didn't want this to happen to another ethnic group like it happened to them. So, so many, so many more of them have been speaking out. That was, I mean, I learned that during all the interviews I did with people. They just didn't want this to happen to another ethnic group. So they came and spoke out more. Okay. Well, um, anyone else has a comment or question? Um, oh, so folks, yes, this is being recorded and it will be on the um, East Bay Photo Collective YouTube channel. Uh, and so just go to YouTube and search for East Bay Photo Collective and you can see the recordings of all of our talks in this series. There's some really great talks uh, from last year. And then all the talks from this year will be up there. Um, it takes a couple of days uh, for me to get it um, up there, but it will be on our YouTube channel. So just go to YouTube and search for East Bay Photo Collective. And there's, there's some great talks there. And now there will be another great talk because Paul's talk will be there. Um, so thank you so much, Paul. And this was, like I said, a real special experience for me. And I'm sure it was for all our participants. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And if you want to reach out to me, um, let me put my website back up there and contact information one more time. Come on, Come on screen. Itagakiphoto.com. Okay. So yeah, so this this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, and Paula, yeah, I hope we can get a chance to get together someday in our, our new location. This was originally supposed to be an in-person presentation, uh, but it still turned out to be something incredibly special. So and if there's any more people who know anybody who's in any of those historical pictures, Aha. send what? you guys the site and you can look by camp to what uh, camp you think your parents might have been in or what city they were living in beforehand. And I'll point you in a direction and you can look, try to search through the photos and see if you can find any of your family members. So reach out to me if you want and I'll send you the links, whatever, to help you look for your family photos. Wow, that's exciting, a chance to dive right into history. Yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Saul, for setting this up. Thank you, everybody who participated. It is so wonderful to share this with you. I hope to see you next month at our uh, next presentation, Second Tuesday. And, um, uh, and once again, thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, have a wonderful evening.